it's my great pleasure to introduce David Pietraszewski. I hope I say it right. <laughs> yeah, it's every every one of my uh, family members says it differently. So it's uh, however right. you say it. <laughs> so how do you say it? Uh, I say Pietraszewski. It's the uh, sort of uh, the incorrect American way to say it. Uh, I went to Poland uh, a couple of years ago, and I was able to ask somebody how to correctly say it. I won't try to do that, but uh, but Pietraszewski is how I say it. So Pietraszewski. Yeah. Yeah, Petra Zuski, like P like a plant, zoo like a zoo, ski like ski. So, but uh, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a, it took me a long time to learn how to spell and say it. So, <laughs> that's good. So, I'm not sure I can, I can still master yeah, it. No, that's fine. <laughs> Petra Zuski. Yeah. So David is a research fellow at the Max Planck, uh, Max Planck Institute in Berlin. So I met uh, David in the summer of 2019 when we were to just discovered some overlap in our research interests. And he's just doing wonderful, wonderful work on evolutionary psychology, looking at mechanisms of detecting alliances and, and, and divisive alliances which I found very, very, very useful for my, my thinking about, about slurs and, and oppressive speech. So he's, he's um, yeah, running experiments, um, looking at, at the factors that influence race perceptions and particular categorization and, um, and looking at how these have been evolutionary, uh, yeah, developed. And so, yeah, and, yeah, I, I can't say enough how much I, I, I love your work and I'm still kind of reading on the nature last paper that oh, you- Oh yeah, yeah, fresh off the press, yes, exactly, yeah. This month mm -hmm. <laughs> in, uh, on the hypothesis that racial categorization is a byproduct, pro byproduct of evolved uh, alliance tracking capacity. Mm -hmm. So, and today he's going to talk about understanding oppressive speech through the lens of human um, uh, humans evolved coalitional psychology. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. And thanks everybody for being here Thursday afternoon uh, on Zoom talk. So I uh, um, hope you're doing good. Thanks for being here. Um, thanks for uh, inviting me. Um, and this is very uh, cool to be here because um, I think uh, I'm like um, you know, I said, I'm an experimental psychologist and I've been thinking a lot about um, the psychology of race and racism uh, for a long time, but thinking about um, oppressive speech acts is sort of a, a new thing for me. And so um, what I'm going to present today is sort of an initial foray into this, and I've uh, built in a lot of time for discussion and questions uh, because I'm very interested in talking to people um, who have been thinking about the pragmatics of, the, of uh, oppressive speech acts, which is not something I've been thinking about. I'm coming at it from a, from a slightly different angle. So hopefully there's some uh, points of uh, convergence. So thanks so much. Um, so... Uh, Let's see. So um, uh, as was mentioned, and uh, what I've been studying for over a decade now is the psychology uh, that is responsible for producing phenomena out in the world like racism. And these are photos uh, from the 1950s uh, during uh, US uh, uh, integration um, uh, after uh, civil rights uh, was enacted. And of course, uh, we can update these photos the last couple of years. The U.S. is just one example, but um, unfortunately, the phenomenon of racism or ra uh, race-based conflict um, is not something that uh, is going away or uh, receding into history by any means. So it makes it uh, particularly relevant to study right now. Um, and the basic premise of my work is that understanding the systems or mechanisms in the mind um, is a helpful way to think about the phenomenon of racism. Uh, or, uh, uh, or racial-based conflict. Um, but at the same time, looking at the phenomenon itself is also a way to think about, well, what are the underlying mechanisms in the mind that make this possible? So I view this as a two-way street. Um, and that's basically my approach. Um, so today I'm just gonna, I'll just give you a quick overview. I'll talk about my general approach because this is a multidisciplinary audience and because what I do, uh, I, I think is a bit different from what uh, other folks are doing here on this meeting. Um, I'll just talk about my general approach. I'll talk about sort of the central insight or idea that I wanna present today and then we'll open up for questions and discussion. Um, and, uh, um, and yeah, please, if you have questions uh, uh, during at all, uh, please just note it down and I'd be happy to talk about any part of this um, at the end, so. Okay, so 
Um, to begin with, um, the, the way I think about the mind uh, or approach to the mind is uh, you can think about this uh, using an example. So if you think about a, a computer um, or maybe more fancifully a robot or maybe uh, in between, maybe something more pra practical like a, a vacuum cleaning robot, there's a couple different ways you can describe or characterize the way it behaves. So for example, you can ask, well, why does a, a vacuum cleaning robot avoid a wall? And one way you could describe its behavior is uh, what the uh, philosopher Dan Dennett has called the intentional stance or is just sort of the everyday way people talk about the behavior of things. So like the robot wants to avoid the wall, right? Um, of course, there's another level of description which is to talk about actually how it works in terms of mechanisms. Um, and so for example, this could be a hypothetical way that the, uh, room, the Roomba avoids a wall. It produces a sound, sees if there's a, a sound returned and if not, it continues, and if there is, uh, it deploys a right turn command. Um, so this is an abstract mechanical description of how the thing works. Uh, and then there's a final level of description, which is actually how the stuff is physically implemented, right? So motors, wires, et cetera. Um, and this is not only true for describing things like robots or um, computers, this is also the way you can approach the mind. Um, so you can talk about people or the mind in terms of mental states, beliefs, or desires. You can talk about um, mechanical functions, or you can actually look at the neural implementation of those uh, mechanical functions. And the way I approach the mind is that middle level of mechanical function. And the reason for doing that is it allows us to get very precise about uh, what information processing we think is going on underlying a phenomenon. Okay. So just as a shorthand, we can, I'm going to just call this or think about this as sort of a robotic approach to humans. And it, it may sound a little alien, but again, it's the point is to be uh, precise about what we think is going on in the mind. Um, and then as alluded to before in the lovely introduction, the other part of this uh, I use is thinking about, well, what is the if we think about this as sort of software of the mind, what is it actually built for? How does it work? Um, and the way that, uh, I, that helps me think about that is thinking that, well, ultimately the software that's in the mind is built by the environment um, and specifically over multiple generations um, and what counts as what uh, is a success or a failure and what the kinds of functions we would expect to see are all things that are relevant to things that are about survival or reproduction of humans. Um, and so you can think about this um, in this sort of shorthanded way is everything in the mind is sort of an input output device and we're only allowed to think about things in the mind that would take in aspects of the environment over multiple generations and that would produce things that would lead to reproduction or survival. Um, now this is just very abstract, this is very general and we can just sort of pin this as uh, just uh, as a shorthand, as just taking an evolutionary approach. So combining this robotic and evolutionary approach is sort of the way I approach um, all of my work. Um, uh, and what I've done specifically with this approach is ask a question, which is why does the mind perceive race? Or more specifically, why do people categorize people uh, by their race? Um, which had long been uh, um, a topic of study and there wasn't a lot of progress made for a long time, um, but we've made quite a bit of uh, progress um, in recent um, years. Um, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about the details here. I'm happy to answer questions during question answer session. But one of the things I do is I look at implicit social categorization. So people are not conscious of categorizing by things like age, sex, or race, or team membership, or political affiliation, or accent. But we use a really cool paradigm where we basically show people sequence of faces, um, and then we look at their patterns and memory errors that people aren't aware that they're producing. And that allows us to get at uh, to what degree are they categorizing by things like race, um, for example. And using this really cool paradigm, and I'm just showing this slide um, to just show data because that's what you should do when you're an experimental psychologist is show data. Um, but basically, uh, we've got thousands of participants, um, dozens of experimental um, conditions, and we've gotten really consistent results that basically show that uh, racial categorization is not a, a inevitable feature of the way the mind works. And that in fact, when you show people that um, there's a new, new group membership that's more relevant to how people are interacting and getting along, people non-consciously are willing to abandon the degree to which 
they categorize people by their race. And this is different from other categories, things like their sex or their accent or their age. So there really seems to be something about race being um, this kind of uh, running off of the system for sort of attending to flexible groups. And the sort of jargony way to put this is that racial categorization seems to be a byproduct of our evolved coalitional psychology. And I'll talk about what coalitional psychology is in a second, but the basic idea is, is what I just said, that it's um, racial categorization is a, a product of a system that's whose function is to flexibly attend to social relationships. Okay. Um, and uh, I wanna talk a little bit about what this coalitional psychology is, um, which is basically, uh, it's one of the things that allows us to do all the weird things that humans do, which is to cooperate among lots of people, um, engage in conflict with people and coordinate our actions, um, do weird things like um, dress up in similar clothing um, uh, and celebrate sporting events and things like that. And so basically it's a psychology for tracking patterns of cooperation, conflict and coordination. Um, and for allowing people to engage in these kinds of behaviors and predict the behaviors of others based on these patterns. This is the kind of thing that's evolutionarily really important. Um, and you can think of this as a shorthand of it's really the psychology that makes it possible to understand and engage with groups uh, or sets of people. And we've learned quite a bit about how this coalitional psychology works in the experimental studies that I was just briefly alluding to. And in some, in, in some cases in very fine drained detail. Um, and so what I wanna talk about today is a very specific kind of set of functions of this coalitional psychology that I think are uh, relevant for understanding oppressive speech acts. And so we'll move on to now, this is sort of the, the part of the talk where uh, where we get into uh, the intersection between my press approach and the, um, the approach here of um, oppressive speech. And so um, this is all to, as a conceptual waypoint, we're just kind of a stylized view of the social world. Um, and so we're just gonna consider two focal individuals. And one important thing to do is to figure out very basically is if these two human beings interact, what is their relationship gonna be like? Is it gonna be positive? Is it gonna be negative? Uh, this is just a really basic important function for the mind to figure out. Um, and now there's a couple ways to do this. One is you can just say, well, are they friends? Um, are they enemies? And that you know, gives you um, some indication of how they're likely to get along. Um, but the second that we add a third party to the mix, um, things get rather complicated. So for example, even if these two people are really quite bitter enemies, um, depending on who the third party is, they may actually get along in the presence of this third party. So for example, if these two focal individuals are parts, uh, members of opposing sides in a civil war, they may actually get along and unite against this third party or this group of people if it's an outside invading force, for example. This kind of thing happens all the time in history. Or even if these two focal people are friends, or um, if the third party is the romantic partner um, uh, or spouse of one of the people, then they might not side with the, the friend, they might side with the romantic partner, right? So even if, uh, no, ma no matter what the intrinsic relationship is, the presence of third parties really complicates the goal of predicting how people are likely to get along or who they're gonna side with if a conflict comes up. So the, one of the points then is that the presence of third parties fundamentally changes social relationships. And this is a, a feature of the world that really complicates the psychology that is trying to predict how the social world works. And then the other thing that's true is that there's lots of social relationships in the world. So people have their religions, they may have their tribal identities, they can have kinship identities, and these can be nested multiple identities that uh, overlap. Um, they can also be sort of orthogonal. So you share in religion with some people and nationality with some people. Um, and we, uh, um, we can think about lots of examples of this, but the point is basically there's many kinds of these third party social relationships and the relationship between them can often be complicated. It's not at all straightforward. There are many, many groups um, in the social world. And so when two people interact, there's this question then of, well, how are they likely to get along? And uh, from an information processing perspective, 
the, the things that we often think of when we uh, either consciously or non-consciously call up about people, like their religion, their gender, their tribe, their nationality, their race, their occupation, uh, these are all um, things that may or may not be relevant for understanding this particular um, interaction. And so trying to figure out which of these things is relevant is really the job of the coalitional psychology. We experience that we're able to kind of do this in many cases automatically and effortlessly, in some cases with some effort, but in both cases, the, the idea is that this is really what the job of this coalitional psychology system is doing. So um, its job just to review is to keep track of these possible third party relationships and then to determine which ones are relevant in a particular interaction. And so now we're moving in to the central insight here, which is oppressive speech acts. Um, and so the idea is that oppressive speech acts, whether the example be um, a sexist uh, speech act or a racist speech act, um, uh, mundane or extreme in all cases, the central premise is that um, the oppressive speech act is a strategic attempt to manipulate this psychology um, of the perpetrator, of the person doing it, of the victim, the recipient, and bystanders, so as to activate those third-party relationship representations that benefit the perpetrator at the expense of the victim or the recipient. Okay, so for example, um, in the case of a sexist um, speech act, like let's say it's two individuals, um, and up until now the interaction has been one of coworker, um, and maybe employee and boss, right? Um, and then um, this focal individual produces an oppressive speech act um, that's based around um, uh, that's based around gender or sex. And so the idea is that what's happening in the information processing system um, of everybody involved is that this new social identity is being called up. And what it's doing um, non-consciously is it's basically uh, activating the relevance of a history of these two sets of people, men and women, and in particular, where there's been a history of a power differential um, uh, um, around or uh, uh, focused around this, this dimension. So it's saying, it's not just that we're coworkers, it's not just I'm your employee, I'm also a male. And there are actually many other people like me who expect uh, better treatment or to have power in this relationship. Um, uh, because this identity, I'm bringing it into this relationship. That's basically the pragmatics of what the Oppressive Speech Act is doing, um, regardless of the content. And in many cases, the pragmatics of it are, it's basically that it's all of us against you. So that it's sort of, there's many people standing behind me in a virtual way um, who have inherited this history, um, have this power or status differential. And it's all of us uh, who are expecting better treatment and we're, uh, um, so it's, a, it's basically a way to leverage many more people's power against the, the victim of the Oppressive Speech Act. Um, the same thing, the same principle applies to something like a racist speak, speech act. Um, uh, people just walking down the street are just citizens of, of whatever place they live. But if this speech act occurs, then it calls up um, this, this historic distinction between, for example, uh, black and white individuals. And it's again, uh, signaling in this, uh, the, the implicit pragmatics of this are that um, there's a long history of people who uh, have been willing to um, uh, demand better treatment or, um, uh, or worse um, from people like you. And so I'm reminding you of this uh, history and the person is saying that they're expecting this, um, this power differential to be acknowledged. Um, and in some sense, it's, it's a threat of this power differential. And that's, that's the basic idea. Um, so the idea then is that, uh, again, keeping with the kind of robot approach, the mechanistic approach, is that all of these pragmatics are delivered by the operation of this underlying psychology. And the idea is that it's not at all uh, conscious, the operation of this engagement of these group identities, the inference that um, there's many other people standing behind the person producing the oppressive speech act, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but it's felt. Um, and so the idea is that uh, this is why oppressive speech acts feel demoralizing or somebody's robbing you of your power when, they, when they're directed at you. 
um, it's because that's exactly what they're designed to do. Um, and there's this underlying information processing that's very precise and, and complex that, but then kind of leads to just the general feeling of this just feels bad um, when you're the target of it. Um, and uh, it also uh, explains why cues of power behind these social identities or these third party relationships are in fact a really important social resource and are fought over. So for example, in uh, the recent um, uh, events of, uh, of people are trying to change the uh, perception of how, uh, how powerful or important these social identities are. Um, and that's the reason for that is one of the arguments for the reason for that aside from the real concrete um, uh, things is that the psychological relevance of these social identities allows things like oppressive speech acts to have teeth or not depending on um, the perceived power of these social relationships. Um, one of the other themes to, to draw back on though is from an evolutionary perspective, what we know about these coalitions or alliances both across cultures and then also from sort of more formal modeling work is that the kinds of social relationships that people can engage in is fundamentally flexible, which means that uh, we're not destined to, uh, to have to live with these kinds of oppressive speech acts along whatever dimension they occur. Um, and so, uh, um, so even though the underlying machinery is constant, the content of what is actually being done is flexible and there are things that can be done to change uh, oppressive speech acts. And so in principle, um, ways to change oppressive speech acts that are informed by this approach are things like, like I alluded to a second ago, is that the actual psychological uh, uh, perception of power of the social identities has, has real implications for the, uh, the teeth of an oppressive speech act. Um, in a sense, without a social identity that has differential power behind it, oppressive speech acts really lose their, uh, their oppression, right? Their, um, uh, their bite. Um, but of course that depends on very broad social trends. And of course these things can be changed, but there's more acute things that can be done as well. Um, and I'll just include one here, which is in that's based on this uh, in principle theory, um, which is that um, bystanders that emit cues of their own that conflict with cues emitted by the perpetrator can undermine the pragmatics of the oppressive speech act. So for example, in particular, for both examples that we looked at before, um, if there's a bystander, particularly from the group or social identity that is being appealed to as sort of standing behind figuratively the, the person committing the oppressive speech act. So another male uh, worker in the workplace or another white citizen, just as a toy example, um, if that person can basically within the interaction present cues that, no, I'm not actually siding with you, um, you racist person, you sexist person, um, but are instead siding with the other person that can, um, that can uh, according to the theory, undermine um, the, the, uh, what the Oppressive Speech Act is doing or trying to do in terms of that, um, in, in terms of that relationship. And so um, I just uh, wanna um, note then that the better that we can understand the evolved psychology underlying the uh, oppressive, uh, the pragmatics underlying the pragmatics of oppressive speech acts, the better able we'll be able to combat and prevent them. Um, and we're starting to know quite a bit about the psychology underlying uh, coalitions. And I think that this will be a really interesting um, point of connection. And so at this point, I think I'll just um, leave it at that and open it up for some questions and discussion. Thank you for your uh, time and attention. Thank you so much, David. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks. So the floor is open for questions. We have uh, plenty of time. Great. So if you can, yeah, if you can uh, stop the sharing, that would be easy. Would be, uh, yeah, absolutely. Let's. Uh, so you can type Q or or raise your hand. I see Hallie, Sally Haslinger. Good to see you. Hi. Um, sorry, I missed the earlier part of the session. I've been, I didn't get up until too late. Um, anyway, so uh, thank you uh, very much for the talk. It was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I have a kind of complex question, but uh, I hope I can get it out quickly. Okay. So it seems from your general approach that you're looking at a kind of 
mechanistic, individualistic, levels-based analysis of human behavior. And I'm a little worried about that because I would have thought that um, a complex dynamic, complex systems approach might be better here mm -hmm. rather than the approach you're taking. And, um, and you might think, well, why is this relevant? Because nothing I said hinges on that. But I, I worry because um, as a psychologist, I understand that you're interested in human individual psychology, mm -hmm. but a lot of what you're talking about is what speech acts do and what speech acts are designed to do, et yes. cetera, et cetera. And that is a kind of taking a Denetian intentional stance mm -hmm. toward a speech act, right? Or toward, uh, in a way that mm -hmm. seems a little weird to me. And so, because of course, um, there's a lot of things that people do that are embedded in social practices that you might even want to say their individual psychology is not the crucial factor in trying mm -hmm. to explain why they're doing that, why they're moving their hands in this way and such like this, sure. because they're engaged in practices that are social practices and such sure. like that. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of sometimes our speech is that, you know, it's it's part of a broader system. So I'm, I'm a little confused about, on one hand, you seem to be committed to a methodology that is going to be mechanistic, explaining in terms of stuff going on in the hardware to mm. make in an individual. And on the other hand, you're doing a, what looks to me more like a complex system analysis where there's, there's this note that's not a kind of levels of explanation, but there's this complex feedback yeah. um, between the social and the individual and such. So does that make sense? Yeah, totally. No, no. I mean, so it's a great question. I very much appreciate the, the, the sentiment behind it. And I mean, to, to, to just sort of rephrase it, it's essentially you're saying, well, this methodological individualism is not enough, right? Uh, totally. Um, uh, so I completely agree. And so basically what I would say is, um, so number one, um, uh, I don't view thinking about the psychological, the psychology mechanistically in opposition with then thinking about the dynamics that those individual psychologies create. Um, and I don't think that, um, uh, so for example, I'm a, I am a more relative uh, methodological individualist, but I do think that uh, uh, working with other people who think about sociological trends or looking at sociological trends or social dynamics, complex social dynamics from the perspective of the individual psychology can be mutually informative. And that's work I try to do as well. And so to just give you an example though of how they're not in opposition. So one of the things my collaborators and I have done is looked at uh, racial categorization cross-culturally. And we've looked at, um, for example, in Brazil. Um, and one of the things we had found is that um, using this theory that's very mechanistic and thinking about, well, what cues would in principle this kind of hardware software kind of use, we then looked at broad social demographic trends, like things like um, social class correlating with um, what people look like across different states in Brazil, for example. And we found a kind of relationship that would we would predict based on this this um, uh, the, this um, uh, this mechanistic hypothesis, and so um, it's the kind of example of by knowing what um, how what kind of cues the system uses, um, it can give you purchase into privileging certain kinds of dynamics to maybe look for or expect, and also the things to to change as well. And I'll just say one more thing, and then I can follow, uh, please follow up, is to say. But, but I'm also 100% in agreement that I don't think just methodological individualism is sufficient or even psychology. So I'm a psychologist. I don't think if you want to understand something as complex as a speech act, and I have some, you know, uh, there, there, I have some training in um, uh, linguistics as well. Um, absolutely, I don't think psychology is... Uh, is sufficient on its own to understand a speech act. And so I'm just saying, look, we can look at the psychology and the more we know about this one piece, the better we can have the whole system and it can be mutually informative. So don't disagree at all. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. So just to follow up, if that's okay, sure. have, is that okay? okay. Well, yeah. so, um, so yes, it, it's certainly the case that we need to have some uh, reflection on individuals and individual psychology. And um, I appreciate your, recognition that it's not all individualistic explanation mm -hmm. in here. But I'm I'm wondering about whether you know anything about um, Ted Zawitsky's work, Mind Shaping. Mm 
No, I don't, I don't know. Well, so he's he's uh, look, he has has a book called Mind Shaping, and part of what's going on, and I, what I think is kind of compatible with what you're saying, and maybe interesting to think about, is the ways in which. And I also really like the fact that that this coalitional psychology is flexible and responsive to the environment. But he's looking at the ways in which um, uh, developmentally we we um, mimic the behavior of adults in our environment without even knowing. I mean, there's there's a certain amount of mimicry that goes on that is the basis for social practices, and then those social practices kind of. Uh, inform, you know, when there's a stable social practice that informs what we start looking at and what we start paying attention to and what we start remembering and what end up being the cues. And so, and so what the way I think of that is that there is this um, dense interconnection between the social pattern um, and the individual psychology um, that is, you know, entrenched through this uh, participation with others um, in, a, in a social milieu. And so what you want to have, and I think this could be friendly to your account, is a, is a way of understanding how social practices start being embedded in our bodies, so to speak, and our perceptual systems and, and these sorts of things. But the explanation of them is going to be at the social level, and it seems like that's very compatible with with what you're saying. But it's but it ends up being a kind of top down explanation rather than a bottom up explanation. Um, so just real quick, and then we can. But this is all great, and maybe we can continue this conversation some other time too. But um, yeah. so just too quick, I, I completely agree that the social world will produce, especially developmentally. Um, will will cause things right, and so I don't disagree at all. And in fact, there are, there are predictions about what the developmental cues are. I'm a developmental psychologist as well. I have another hat, um, and so I also do developmental studies on this and how it's acquired. Um, two quickly things, though, I would say still though that even though the uh, dynamics of the social world cannot be understood just through methodological individualism, it's still the case that for a feature of the social world to affect us, we have to have psychological mechanisms that can attend oh, yeah. to those things. And so, so I think still understanding the psychological mechanisms is yeah. still important. I don't, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. and then the other, and, and I don't, the top down bottom up thing, I'm not sure people kind of use that term. I'm not sure if it's particularly really appropriate for my work in the sense of even what we would think of as high level things are still described in terms of this mechanistic way. So I'm not sure Top down bottom, I mean, it's a metaphor um, and it has connotations. And so uh, maybe we can talk about that more in detail. But yeah, but there's a lot that. of philosophy of science on this that I could, I could push your way if you wanted. Great, thank you. Sure. Super. So next question from Alex. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I think I was trying to get clear on, on how you get from the psychology you described to the kind of story you tell about oppressive speech acts. So, so if I understood correctly, the, the basic idea about these speech acts is that they somehow convey or evoke or, I don't know, that something like we are all against you or something like that. That's some kind of message that's somehow being gotten across or something like that. And then, but the, the psychology you, you described, I guess, was mainly about this coalition building stuff where you, where you suggested that, you know, people's willingness um, for building coalitions with others depends on like the kind of group they you know sort them into like if you think of somebody as your co-worker I guess you might be more willing to form a coalition than when you think of them as I don't know someone from a, something else but you know I, I didn't see how you get from that to this idea about like what these speech acts convey or get across because I mean so suppose there are just two people and one guy commits or, or engages in some kind of oppressive speech and there's no no one around to form coalitions with anyway so so then these effects that you were describing wouldn't you know, wouldn't have any effect there because they, they, no one wants to form coalitions anyway. And then so, yeah, I, I think I'm just missing the a step like from this stuff to I hear you as saying you belong to this big group that hates me or something like that. Sure. Thanks for the comment. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I didn't have really a lot of time to talk about uh, all of the uh, of the psychology, the coalitional psychology. And so um, let me let me kind of 
take what you've said and characterize it. You can tell me if I'm being fair. And, and, and it's, it's a complicated story. So it's not, confu- it's not surprising that in a, a short little bit of time, you're, you're still confused. But basically the idea is that um, if, if there was a world in which there were only two people ever, you're right, then you wouldn't need this story, right? It wouldn't exist. Nothing like this would, ha- would happen, but that's not the world we live in. And so, um, but the basic idea is that the psychology is not the psychology. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say the characterization you had is quite right in the sense of a lot of what the psychology is for is for anticipating um, uh, actions or the behavior of people that aren't present. So it's not the case that it just requires immediate people. And that was all sort of stylized. Um, the idea is that because people can communicate, because social interactions extend over time and can be abstract, is that really the way the psychology has to work. And if you think about this, even from sort of a robotic perspective, um, uh, uh, that there has to be a, um, a sort of allowance for uh, virtual uh, audiences and virtual relationships because these will be real, right? Like um, if you walk down the street as a gang member, uh, you wearing the gang clothes keeps you safe even if your other gang members aren't present, right? There's a real reason why that is. And that's because of the way the psychology works. Um, and that's why people wear gang colors, right? And so, um, so I'm not sure. Uh, so I would just push back against that idea that immediacy and presence is required. Um, and that's just one example of the kind of comment um, I would make in response to what you said. There's probably a lot more to say, um, but that's at least for now, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So our next question is from Christoph. Um, yes. So, so I was wondering about the... Um, the way the, uh, the the peer pressure sort of works, right? Like you, you had this very good argument where it's about the bystanders, the the kinds of groups that you belong to, and the people that expect a certain behavior of you, sort of uh, kind of like a virtual peer pressure, uh, even if they're not present. Mm-hmm. So, so on the one hand, a model would sort of predict that the the more people you have behind you, you sort of the gang example, like the gang, the bigger the gang is, the more powerful it is the more loyalty they expect, that they expect a certain behavior, they can enforce the certain, certain behavior, uh, which is quite different than from just you and a bunch of friends and, and yeah. But what you find in the real world is oftentimes that um, this kind of sense of righteousness and then bonding between groups. So a lot of times the smaller the groups are, you have this kind of almost like Spartan sense that uh, you have these very close social bonds between these people and they feel even more righteous because they feel like uh, everyone else is against them the mainstream is against them and Mm -hmm. sort of how does that work so a lot of times you have these small groups that feel even more connected and uh yeah so yeah it's a great question and that's this is that's a long this is something i think a lot about and it's it's a great insight and i think um, I think the way to think about it is you're exactly right that there's power in small numbers in the sense of intensity, in the sense of uh, loyalty um, that you won't get in a large group, but a large group is still very powerful because of all the things it can do. And so if you look at, um, uh, and there's kind of everything along that continuum. And so I think uh, um, uh, what, I do, what people want ideally is you want the loyalty and person, uh, personal sort of uh, knowledge um, uh, and responsiveness of a small group with the power of a large group, right? And I think it's a constant negotiation um, and people do a lot to sort of uh, move that in those directions. Um, but, uh, but I don't, do, I mean, your question, so, I mean, the short answer to your question is yes, both of those things occur. And I think a lot of the dynamics of um, social identities and the, the kind of power of uh, social identities is, and even friendships, right? Because I think mm-hmm. even oppressed, and I, and I don't actually know this to be true, but I, but I would argue that it's possible that oppressive speech is a larger category of things than maybe is just, 
technically um, uh, known social identities that are shared by many people. Like it might be that one could argue that in a preschool or like a kindergarten, maybe not a preschool, but like kindergarten or uh, you know, a playground, there's oppressive speech acts that, that even if you ignore any kind of large scale social identities, right? Um, they're still like this click or that click, right? And it, the same dynamic occurs. And so I think it does happen on every scale. Um, all I can say in the short time is that yes, this continuum occurs. I think you're exactly right that this trade-off occurs. And I think that um, part of the, the psychology is um, looking for uh, belongingness in wanting both the um, intensity of a small number, but still the power, if you will, of large numbers. And that's the best I can do in a short time, if that, yeah. if that is helpful. Uh, I was also thinking about like the uh, the Nazi Germany kind of example, where a lot of people used to say like like they, they felt sort of empowered being part of something bigger. That, mm -hmm. that is a phrase that came up a lot. So yes. it, it seems to be something weird. There, there, there seems to be something about small group that, groups that is attractive from a psychological point of view yeah. uh, as part of human nature, but also some, some people really like sort of getting lost, just almost losing their identity and just being a, just this kind yeah. of uniform, wearing one little person <laughs> in, a, in a large group kind of. Uh, so, so, so some people want this identity. They want the power in the, in the gang. They want to be the... Uh, the per the person that sort of bosses everyone around and tells everyone what to do, and then everyone, uh, some other person is is more inclined towards the other thing. Oh. Yeah, it's great, and it's, I think yeah. that that, that individual difference I think also is reflected universally. Though even if people lean both ways, I think everybody feels both things. And mm -hmm. there's a really interesting complex psychology underlying that. And one thing quickly to say is, the the thing about sort of all co coalescing around something other than a person, um, and sort of an idea, and that feeling good. Um, is also in part because people, you know, die, you know, people, uh, uh, so, so, so sort of there, I think there's even uh, an acknowledgement within the psychology of it's nice to, you know, be uh, unified around an idea or principle, and that even feels mm -hmm. good and different from being allied or around a particular person, mm -hmm. because uh, these things have different kind of shelf lives. Um, and but in different coordination yeah. possibilities, because so, people can coordinate you better, but they're they're kind of if they get you know if they turn out to be bad, then your movement dissolves, right? So it's it's yeah. really cool, complicated stuff, and uh, it's a great comment, and there's lots more to dig into. So thanks. Great. So we move on to a question from Eric. Thanks a lot for the talk. I was so interested in the way you were talking about in-group bystanders undercutting the cues inter admitted by the perpetrator. Um, and I, one thing that interested me about that was, it seems likely to me that um, if an out-group bystander emits a cue with the same content, the uptake will be most of the time, you know, not as effective, right? right? If someone says, well, my husband doesn't think that in a context, right. in a sexist context, like you were talking right. about. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if that's right and, and why that's, that's right, why it's not about the content so much as the person um, delivering it. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And I think the theory would predict that that's right in the, in the, in the sense of all else equal the same content coming from the in-group as opposed to the out-group, as you put it, it would be exactly right. And um, that said, of course, so the out-group saying it is still better than nobody, right? Because it's still a reminder, look, there's other people who still will respond to this negatively. And so if somebody feels like they can victimize people with impunity versus other people will respond, of course, that's gonna make a difference. So it's still better to respond. But the, I think what's key about it, and I think you alluded to this already in your question is um, the reason why the in-group member is so important is because implicit, in what the person was doing is they're, they're basically saying, I am getting, um, uh, me as the person who's doing the perpetrating, I'm getting some of my status and power in this speech act uh, to you because of the power of these social structures or other people. And so if there's a concrete instance of the, these other people that I'm sort of appealing to as being on my side and not only me, but the person that I'm talking to, the victim also sees that, oh, 
you know, the person that the, the, the person who should have had my back as a bad guy doesn't have my back, right? That's, that's basically the equivalent of the gang member walking down the street. The other gang member, you know, starts harassing the guy and then the other gang members, you know, like are like run away, right? Like, so that's basically to really, to flip it into sort of a negative uh, uh, analog. It's basically that. Now, of course, um, it's more complicated than that. And of course, people can say, you know, a racist person might be well, like, well, this person who's, you know, the same race isn't one of us, but it, it, but it can still reduce the size back to the, for, you know, the previous comment, it can reduce the power and size of the in-group that has to be appealed to. Um, and so it's shrinking the power of that statement. Um, yeah. So I, I feel like maybe there were two different explanations that are totally compatible, but okay. I heard them both in your answer. So okay. one appeal to concreteness. So mm -hmm. when it's a person who's there, who's doing the undercutting and they're part of that in group, the concreteness yeah. is, um, is evident, it's manifest. And then another part of the explanation was like what you were just saying, the reduction in size. So it's yeah. a suggestion that the uh, in group is more fragmented than it was presupposed to be or something like that. Yeah. Um, those are, you know, that's a yes and kind of explanation, but it seemed to me like someone on someone in the out group, at least if their testimony is still taken as relevant, like as authoritative, and there are going to be lots of cases, I think, that you'll want to talk about where the testimony is still authoritative, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. um, someone on the out group could do the fragmenting thing, right? Yeah. But not the concreteness thing necessarily. Yeah. Um, I, so I, that made me think yeah. maybe concreteness would play a bigger role in the explanation. Yeah, no, I, I think that, I think at some level, yes, and at some level, no, in the sense that I think still, I, I, I still think that even, uh, there's still gonna be a discounting from the out group even even the I don't think it ever kind of gets through completely unfiltered. So even the knowledge from the outgroup I think will be discounted a bit. Um, but I but I completely agree. You know, like you know, in fact, there's you know three racists and there's ten thousand people who aren't. You know, like that information will have an effect. Um, uh, um, so I think I think you're I think it's complicated and I, the, the, there's enough systems in the psychology where I think probably both things happen and there's sort of some average weighting. Um, so uh, that's one of the implications of this mechanistic perspective. It's not like there's sort of a point place where the little person in the head makes a decision, right? So I think probably all these things are happening. Um, and I think you're also getting at a level of resolution that we don't know. And these are exactly the kinds of questions to, to ask. So it's great, yeah. Thanks. Right, so any further questions? I don't see any in the chat or raising hands. Um, please feel free to jump in. If not, actually, I, I have like, a, in a way, a curiosity regarding to your kind of previous analysis with uh, this alliance hypothesis, or coalition hypothesis. <laughs> so you talked about previously in terms of costs and benefits regarding calculation in terms of like how each each individual decides on the side of who to like yeah on we when we on which group to side with um what what are the incentives when you sort of have let's say bystanders who you don't know like yeah who they want to ally with are they i mean can there be shifts so it's like moving from one group to another group and what would be the incentives for having this sort of, um, yeah, you know, exit from one, one group in which you are and then entering for, you know, siding with a new group, like let's say, uh, yeah, neutral bystanders who previously were in racist, but all of a sudden sort of they feel their, their predisposition is increased by various exposure to acts and what yeah. have you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I think it's a broad question, I, I assume, and I think it's, uh, there's a lot to say about it. I think, um, as far as I understand it, I mean, what I would say is one thing is, um, it feels really good to, um, uh, um, uh, it feels really good to sort of, uh, at least for me, and I'm, I'm, uh, um, 
uh, and there are individual differences in this, but sort of just like righteous, uh, you know, moralizing about like somebody treating somebody badly, like, you know, it's really, it feels good to sort of defend third parties. Um, and I actually have a chapter, um, um, I can send you the, the link for it, but I have a chapter that talks about why should people even care, disinterested third parties care about how other people are treated, especially on an evolutionary approach. Um, like what's the logic behind that? And there is a logic behind it. Um, so we can talk a little bit or you, I, I can um, send that to you. Um, but basically, um, you know, uh, there's some, the, talking about in terms of incentives is a little bit tricky because it's not as if necessarily the person is, um, has different motivations. It's just that the system that is, gets, that feels righteous anger because somebody's being treated poorly, um, there's a cost benefit logic to that evolutionarily, whether or not there's any cost benefit calculation being done within the body envelope at the time, right? Um, so I, I wanna just make sure that we're being clear. We're not saying that these are ulterior motives. It's just, you can think about the cost benefit logic basically from an evolutionary perspective of the software caring about how third parties are treated badly. And so one, one just to just say one thing though, is that um, if somebody is just a jerk to people, um, into somebody, then they might be a jerk to you, right? Um, and they're going to be a jerk to the people you care about. That's the kind of person that, um, uh, you know, the world is uncertain. You've got, you know, family, kids, uh, you know, like, do you want that kind of person around? And so that, that, that even just for, as one example is the kind of cost benefit logic that can cause the kind of robots that people are to kind of really care about um, unjustified um, uh, aggression or oppression um, in people. Um, at the same time, there's there's all, always, as we talked about before, there's always um, uh, there's an incentive to sort of belong. And one way that people can belong and get status is to gang up on other people, right? This is the oldest uh, story in human history, um, and so when you're talking about sort of the cost benefit motivations of people, there can be uh, tugs and pulls to sort of say, well, look, you know, there's this principle and I feel like this is not right that this person is doing this, but then there's also, but if I side with the bully, right, uh, then I can at least avoid the bully picking on me um, and maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, I get a little bit of status or protection um, as well from other people. And so, um, I think, you know, thinking about this almost from the perspective of playgrounds in like high school or middle school is probably the, the, the kind of archetype of probably how the psychology works and it kind of gets scaled up um, at a larger scale. But, um, but those are the kinds of pushes and pulls for different decisions. Is that the kind of question you're asking or? Um... Yeah, I think I mean, I'm, I'm interested, yeah, how, how people, let's say from a certain, um, yeah, certain mental makeup, let's say they, they are uh, uh, allying with a particular group, but then if there is some, some incentive, let's say if a, a power or status from another group, they yeah. would be perhaps, uh, you know, willing to shift or, right. like, yeah, what, what? Yeah, and I mean, I think it's complicated. And I think those are the kinds of questions you have to ask. And I think we don't, you know, we're still in the early stages of the science and I think, it's complicated, but you have ideas about what kind of things to throw at that situation, at least in principle. Um, but it's complicated because there's also things like, you know, what's the future prospects of it? Who are the kind of people around me? If everybody, if all my friends, you know, yeah. like, so there's some kid and all of his friends are, you know, racist, like belong to like, you know, uh, racist organizations, then like one teacher at a school or, you know, a, a invited guest speaker, you know, that that person is calculating, well, like, is this person going to affect my social world at all, right? Like, no, they're just dropping in and leaving, you know, that's a very different kind of intervention than sort of changing the social world that this kid's going to be in. And if the kid is like, look, I can I can have status and, uh, and have some aspirational thing in a different social path than, than this thing I'm doing. And that way is not involving, you know, being a member of this racist organization or something. That's a very different um, thing than just sort of uh, somebody dropping in for a school program. And so, um, so those are the kinds of things in principle that like there's pretty straightforward things about um, 
you know, uh, what's the time scale? What's the time horizon? How is this really going to affect the kinds of status or power that, for example, a kid or an adult is really going to care about? Um, and uh, and I think work could be done and maybe is being done. I'm not fully aware of all the work in this area, but you could sort of in principle, either on a case-by-case -case basis, if you're trying to do a, a targeted intervention or on a more broad scale say, is like, what's the most effective way to do this would be to look at what can be reasonably done and then uh, at every scale and then, and then do those things that based on your thinking about the psychology uh, would be most uh, effective. But again, this is, we're speaking in generalities because there's gonna be lots of these kinds of things. So it's a little bit unsatisfying in that respect. It's pretty general, but. Yeah, no, it's good. I think I, I would like to kind of poke you, but perhaps later on in, in terms of like how this, this connects with pluralistic ignorance and when people kind of decide to, to speak up and, but I see a hand raised uh, from Sally. So this is just a quick follow up so that I, I understand, I'm sure I understand. So on one hand, you talk about the software wanting and how there are this module, this system that wants. And then the other hand, you talk about the individual wanting mm -hmm. uh, or the individual intending. And those seem to me very different things. So it seems that the way I think about cognition, there can be ways in which I am that the software in me, so to speak, is mm -hmm. being responsive to things and doing things that are I wouldn't want to attribute to me. Sort of like when you use the Denetian intentional stance, you can take an intentional stance to me and attribute beliefs and desires and all kinds of stuff to me from that stance that from a psychological point of view or from, from a, a different point of view, you might not want to. And this is where the levels might come in as well. And, and I'm just not sure whether you really think that someone wants to do this when they, you know, I mean, it seems to me that children, white children say all kinds of racist things all the time and are kind of clueless about what's going on. They're clueless about what it means. They're clueless about the impact of it, et cetera, et cetera. And it would be very bizarre to say they want to do this, but it's fine to say, no, there's a module in them that is being responsive to certain cues and resulting in certain kinds of utterances or something like that. And I'm just not clear what level we're at. Yeah, this is a wonderful experience because I, I'm actually I have a paper about modularity and levels of explanation and, and you included the Bechtel stuff. I'm a big fan of William Bechtel work. Okay. But usually I'm on the other side of this where I'm like, be clear about your level of description. Uh, so this is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. This is a great, uh, this is the first time this has happened. So it's lovely. I'm just speaking roughly. So I'm okay. just talking okay. completely shorthand. If I was <clears throat> writing a paper, I'd be very clear, but I'm just because it's short time, but I completely oh, no agree. worries. Yeah, yeah. I so just I, was confused. I just was yeah. confused, and I wasn't sure yeah. what you were going for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. I mean, I, I the way if I was, I usually don't speak precisely because people find it weird. Uh, so I no, I, just I have sort that, of that problem it. too. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> maybe we can have a a, a, a light, <laughs> lovely, precise conversation in our in our coded <laughs> language. So uh, that sounds okay. Great. Okay, great. <laughs> <clears throat> Wonderful. So we have two, two more minutes <laughs> if someone wants to jump in or um, if there are any other issues, David, that you wanted to <laughs> brush off. If not, we can take a break. So I see no one reacting. So I suggest we, yeah, yeah, we <laughs> have a round of applause to David. <laughs> Wonderful and uh, great, lively discussions. So. Yeah. Thanks so much. It was really a pleasure. And uh, please, everybody, feel free to uh, contact me um, with, um, uh, with questions or comments. This was great. And there were a lot of really, really nice discussions. So I look forward to continuing them.